Funding for this program is provided by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of the complete line of Cajun King seafood seasoning mixes and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Hello, I'm Chef John Foles, welcoming you to this great state of ours. We're real proud of our people, places, and food, and I'd like for you to know a little bit more about it. So join me and some of my friends as we visit the historical food towns of this state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. everybody and welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Pauls and I want to thank you for stopping in the kitchen as we continue to search out those historical food towns of Louisiana. Today we're going to the parish of Point Capi in East Feliciana, that's in the southern part of our state, and to the towns of Jackson and New Roads right on False River, Louisiana. What two great towns. Here we're looking at Millbank Plantation, Leroy Harvest Place, in Jackson. This is in East Feliciana Parish, and this is Bear Corners Restaurant that is run by Mr. and Mrs. Butte. What a great restaurant. This town, some say, was named after Andrew Jackson, who came by to hunt bear in that town. This is Bayou Girl State, and those beautiful Louisiana irises right next to Joseph Dreyfus's General Store. This is in Point Capi Parish, and Joseph Dreyfus's General Store has been around since the late 1800s. It was a pharmacy as well as a general store and about four generations actually worked right here with some of the first pharmacists in the uh, parish of Point Capi. And I'll tell you, we came into the store, there's a wonderful little section of all kind of uh, arts and crafts, of course, a lot of blanket making and, and toys and gifts from eras going by. You can see a lot of all of those nice bottles and little bird houses and artifacts from uh, Many, many years uh, ago, right in the store there, Joseph Drive. Look, at, look behind us sitting at this table. We've got all these great bottles from when the store was a, a pharmacist. We're sitting at the table with Simon and Ray Wilde. They actually had the pharmacist for a long, long time there. We're sitting sampling some of the great food that Chef Joe Majors and his wife, they actually run the restaurant today. And Joe is one of the best chefs in all of South Louisiana, creating some of that wonderful food right here at Dreyfus's General Store. You wouldn't think it's a restaurant by the name. And it's located right there in Point Capi, right outside of False River. Look at that great, great, great restaurant in the background, all these wonderful old tools. And there's a, a historical section also in the restaurant. You can walk around and see pictures of uh, the, stores many, uh, the store many years ago, as well as some of the things that you could purchase there pulverized aluminum. I wonder what that was used for. I guess if it didn't make you well, it killed you in a second. Uh, look at the, the, the menu board is up every day. It's open. The restaurant is open for lunch and dinner. And you can uh, uh, come by and pick out something right off of that great menu. This is False River. It said that Iberville uh, actually came and found False River. An Indian guide told him that there was a big lake right off of the Mississippi. And he came in and uh, discovered the lake. This is Guy LaBranche's sailboat. What a beautiful boat. You can see the size of that lake. It's about 22 miles long, and it's an oxbow lake, and there's sailing and boating and fishing, one of the great fishing lakes in the state of Louisiana. Obviously, camps. There's a lot of campsites here, and uh, you can imagine how active this lake would be on a holiday like Fourth of July, Memorial Day. And there's also a lot of residences around this uh, lake, typical of a lot of the waterways in South Louisiana. This here is the back of the Oxbow Restaurant. Oxbow because it is an Oxbow Lake. And uh, this restaurant is actually owned by Ken Heidel. And uh, that's Ken right there to the right. And one of the worst things about having to do this is that every restaurant we go into, they just want to pile all this luscious food in front of us. They boy, what a chore that is, right? And we're sitting at the table. That's Miss Lucy Parlon. She's going to be my guest right there to the right. She's going to be my guest today on the show. I'll tell you about Lucy in a minute. This right here is Phil Plaisance, the chef who came up to the table to shake our hands. And Margie Larson, 
was there. This is fried crawfish tails, one of the delicacies. Cajun popcorn, we call it. And stuffed eggplant. I think that was eggplant stuffed with crawfish. I'm always eating something. I think this is a great crawfish and shrimp jambalaya dish that uh, Ken and Phil prepared for us that day. Miss Lucy is the owner with her husband of Parlange Plantation, one of the beautiful plantation homes that front Falls River. And she was gracious enough to have lunch with us that day. What a wonderful lady. You're going to love her when she comes out to visit the kitchen. This is a stuffed oyster dish, similar to oysters Bienville. Those people can do some serious cooking, not only at the Oxbow, but also at the Dreyfus's General Store, a great place to visit in South Louisiana. And if you ever want to get off the beaten path, Point Capi and the East Feliciana parishes are definitely the two areas that you're going to want to come and spend a little bit of time in. Just wonderful place to visit. Okay, what would we cook when we visit that area? Well, I know that there's a lot of alligators roaming uh, Falls River. There's a lot of alligators all over South Louisiana. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that when you see alligator meat or alligator hides, that we're fooling with an endangered species, but not so. There's a tremendous amount of alligator farming here in Louisiana. And Joe Montese, which is, uh, he's one of the great alligator farmers here in the state. He's with the Alligator Association. And they farm about a million head of alligator every year. They also let so many of the alligators out into the wilds once they get to be about four feet long. So not only are they doing a great industry, but at the same time, they're replenishing the alligators in the swamplands of Louisiana. So if you ever see a little tag on the meat that says Louisiana or domestic alligator meat or Louisiana or domestic alligator hide, you can be assured that that alligator came from a farm-raised community and not an alligator that may be referred to as endangered. There's a lot of alligator being brought into the country illegally, so you want to make sure that the little signs and tags are proper if you're going to buy it. The meat is absolutely fabulous, and I want you to look at this big platter of alligator meat I have right here. I've got different types of meat. I've got some of the meat that you can see how white it is. This is some of the meat right off of the tail section of the alligator. See how nice and white it is? It almost looks like veal, actually. And when pounded out, it becomes very, very tender. Of course, there's not a lot of fat, so of course, it's a meat that's very healthy for you. Here, I have some of the ribs, and these are going on barbecue pits all over Louisiana, as well as outside of the state. This is being shipped all over the, all over the uh, country. Here's the legs, and the leg has a lot of meat on it. It's almost like frog legs, or like a rabbit. Very white, very lean meat. But this is the tail meat, and the tail meat has been pounded out. We can get it in big chunks, and then we can pound it out in our kitchens. And the dish that I want to do for you today using this meat is a scallopini of alligator, just like scallopini of veal. So I'm going to fire up my little skillet here and put a little touch of oil. As I say, you can imagine how lean this meat is. So we're going to want to quickly saute it. And the way we do it, I'm going to take the little scallops like this, and I'm going to put into some lightly seasoned flour. Now, this se uh, flour is seasoned with a little bit salt and pepper. And uh, of course, put your own seasonings in. I'm only going to put a little bit flour on the outside because, again, it's a lean meat. So you want to be careful to coat it so it doesn't dry out when it's cooking. Then I'm going to dip it into an egg batter. Now, this is about four eggs that are just whipped together. And then I'm going to drain off the excess egg and into this platter of fresh parsley, basil, a little cracked pepper, and that's going to coat the outside of the alligator with a really nice look. And again, one third little piece here. Of course, it's a little messy. You have all of that egg on your hands. Then look at this. Look at the nice parsley that's all coating the outside of the meat. Let me wipe all of this parsley off of my hands. I may have to wash a little bit of it off here. But the egg will actually coat the outside of the alligator and put a nice crispy crust on it. I'll move this over to the saute pan and then right down into the oil. Now, you're going to see how fast this dish actually cooks. And it's going to take just a couple of minutes because, again, it's just like veal or white breast meat of chicken. It takes very short time to cook. And once we put it into the saute pan, you want to watch it very, very, cook it very quickly. 
on a high fire. I'm using a vegetable oil here. You can use any type of oil that you like, but I'm just using a really low cholesterol oil and fry it on a hot temperature, about 375 degrees. We're sauteing a lot more than we are deep frying here. Once the egg is crusted on the outside, it's almost like a nice omelet. I'm gonna flip the little scallopini of alligator over. Look how nice and light that is. And then into that, I'm gonna put some pickled okra. And I want you to see this as it goes in. The pickled okra in Louisiana will actually take the place of capers in classical cooking. I'm gonna also put a little bit red bell pepper and a little touch of garlic down into the alligator. And then I'm gonna dust it with just a little touch of flour because I wanna make a little sauce here, a little wine sauce. And imagine that if you're gonna have a veal scallopini in a restaurant, you're gonna have capers and onions and shallots in here. And then the chef would just deglaze with a little white wine. And that's what I wanna do right now. I'm gonna take it right off of the heat. That pickle okra is gonna put a nice spice in there. I'll deglaze. Ooh, I wish you could smell that great, great flavor coming off of there. Let me dust that around. And then I would just go ahead and plate this up because the okra is already cooked. You can imagine that the alligator quick cooks very quickly and all of that great vinegar and wine paste will give the alligator that scallopini taste that we look for in a nice veal scallopini. Move this out of the way for you so we can get some room. And I want to plate this on my nice little platter. So I want you to take a look at this. Oh, watch this go together. How pretty that is. I'm gonna put the scallops right down onto the platter. You can overlap them. That egg has a wonderful crust. The alligator, of course, is nice and tender. And then I would put some of the pickle okra, garlic, a little bit oil that's in there, as well as that great, great, great garlic flavor is gonna come out. And I'm gonna move that out. And basically, that's what the dish is gonna look like. Quickly done, very quickly done. And I can put a little, again, color on top of it. And that's the way it's presented. And I would actually serve this on pasta if you wanted to, just like you would with veal scallopini or some nice sliced potatoes. Scallopini of alligator, great dish in Louisiana, right at False River. Okay, the next dish that I want to do for you is, again, a dish that I found on False River. It's a quiche parlange, a seafood quiche parlange. And this dish, again, is one of those dishes that cooks kind of quickly, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you remember all of the ingredients that's available in your own area. Here on False River or at Parlange Plantation, we have a lot of different seafoods that we can make a quiche with. However, you know that quiche originated in France and we put broccoli in it, we put any kind of cheese uh, uh, to, to flavor it up nicely, but all vegetables, meats, or seafoods go well to make a quiche. So I'm gonna begin by using the flavors of Louisiana. Again, my little black iron skillet, I'm gonna put a little touch of my butter in here, or butter flavored oil, as I like to call it. And I'm gonna begin my quiche by sauteing all of the great flavors of Louisiana. A little bit celery, and again, this is where all the vegetables would come from to take the place of that broccoli and cauliflower and corn. I'm gonna put a little bit of the green and red bell pepper. This is gonna be where all the great colors of the quiche obviously will come in, and then garlic. I have to have that great garlic flavor again right in to the pot. Now I'm gonna let this sit here and saute while I actually make the base of the quiche up. And the quiche is an egg and milk mixture that surrounds a lot of different ingredients. And I want you to take a look at my bowl here because this bowl has all of the ingredients that's gonna go into my quiche parlange. Take a look down into here. First of all, this is an old cypress bowl that was actually handmade on Parlange Plantation, a beautiful old bowl. And I'm gonna put into the quiche some shrimp. I'm gonna put crawfish that's found all over the False River. I've got some catfish and I've taken the catfish and I've poached it off because it's nice and tender. You can see how we'll break it apart. And I'm gonna put spinach in it. Now, 
This dish originally called for a little mustard greens being put into it, but I'm going to use spinach, and I'm going to take the spinach and put it right into my saute pan. I've got some poached off, so I can drop it in. I could put the fresh one in also. So I'll saute that all around, get a little bit more heat here. And once this is all sauteed together, then I would pour it into my quiche shell. So to put the base for the quiche, I've got me a nice little egg mixture here. This is about four or five eggs. Now I've got about three cups of milk or cream. And of course, you can use a skim milk or an evaporated skim milk if you'd like. I whip all of that down into it. Some people may want to stay away from some of the heavy creams in the quiche. Now I'll season it with a little bit cracked black pepper, a little touch of salt, basil, thyme. Remember, we have all those other great flavors in the saute pan already. So once the quiche mixture comes together, then I would move this out of the way and get my pie shell ready. I've got my quiche shell already, and this is just a typical, just a typical pie shell that you would either buy in the store or make from your favorite pie shell recipe. So once that's done, I would add my crawfish down into the bottom. All of my wonderful shrimp can go right into that as well. And then the catfish, just like that. And then I would add my sauteed ingredients here, right out of the saute pan. Let me get this hot spoon. This is so hot. I want to put all those nice flavors right down into the quiche like this. Look at all those pretty colors coming together down there. And then, of course, I have to add my egg mixture right down on top of it like this. Oh, boy, does that look good with all those great, great flavors. And then, oh, I'm messy. And then the cheese. So the nice cheese that's going to go in here like this. And I'm using a spicy jalapeno cheese to give it that really, really good spice. Now, this would go into a 350 degree oven, and I would bake it for about 50 minutes. And let me see, I have one already done here. So let me show you what this quiche looks like once it comes out of that oven after about 50 minutes. Take a look at that. Just a really, really beautiful dish. And you can serve it for lunch, you can serve it for a nice brunch, or out on the patio of one of those either great plantations or your own home, wherever you might live. Seafood quiche, but try it with anything. Okay, what else would we serve with this? Well, on False River, I would have to serve some nice steamed oysters. These oysters are put in a pan with a little lemon juice and basil and thyme, put in about a 375 degree oven for a couple of minutes until they pop open and we would eat them with a little cocktail sauce and horseradish. I would also serve a big platter of these boiled head-on shrimp. Look at this, seasoned with all those great seasonings of Louisiana corn and potatoes. Just sit out on the pier and eat a nice platter of these boiled shrimp. Two very simple hors d'oeuvre dishes used in Louisiana cooking. Okay, I told you I had a good friend of mine who's going to come and visit Miss Lucy Parlange from Falls River. And Lucy owns Parlange Plantation, and she's a great friend. Come on yeah, in there, Lucy. In. How you doing? <laughs> How you so been? So good to see you. Oh, look at this nice piece. Hey, I remember this piece when I was over at the house. How you doing, okay? Oh, it's wonderful to see well, you and be thing. with you. Hey, you, we have to tell them what this is. Tell me exactly what this is. Well, it's a fly catcher. <laughs> a <As> fly catcher? <laughs> Louisiana, I guess in those days, just as now, was full of bugs. <laughs> yeah, right. And as you say, the, the windows and doors were open to catch the breezes in those days, so they... Uh, Probably had a good many more flies even than we do today. So you told me we would put a little honey or cane syrup down here and then put the lid right on top of it and it would sit on the table and the flies would come in from underneath and that ornate glass would mm -hmm. keep the guests from being able to see them in here, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. This was a, this one of the nicest pieces I've oh. seen in a long, long time. Miss Lucy, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you here. Wonderful but when, to be here. When I had the opportunity to visit with you over at Parlange a while back, we, we took a few great shots of the plantation as well as some of the interior shots. And I want to share that with all of our good friends out here. I want you to tell me exactly what we're looking at uh, at the plantation here. Look at this. What are we seeing? Well, that's the house. It's a French colonial house. And uh, really, I guess they just built the way they built to the old country, you know, and that's the front gallery, and now we are welcoming the famous chef folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. 
and, the, and we're now in the dining room, and the, the, now we're in the salon. Look at those beautiful <laughs> and, paintings, huh? Oh, thank you. That's a painting of my husband's great-grandmother, painted in Paris by Dubuff, who was a court artist. That's one of her children, Marie Virginie, and um, she was a mother of um, Madame X, who you mentioned yeah, oh, earlier. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, talk about Madame X. Yeah, yeah, and, look uh, at this furniture. It's an old empire uh, sofa in the room we call the blue room because it was always decorated in blue. <laughs> right. That's a marquetry table made in France in the early days and inlaid pieces of wood with the blue. I mean, with the uh, armalou mounts. <laughs> right, sure. And then that's oh, the a pigeon egg. <laughs> pigeon egg, yeah. And of course, they raised squab. They always had a constant food supply because of having them on hand. And that's a kitchen house that was separate from the main house because as you, you tell about that, if you right, will. <laughs> right, well, well, it was always because of the heat and chance of the fire. You didn't want that beautiful house to burn down. Look at these gardens. Look at that flower. What is that? Is that chameleon? I think that's a chameleon, yeah. Oh, is that I beautiful? believe that's called... Paul Scully, and is that a pink perfection? That, I, it's <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Old, this old sugar cattle. Sugar here. cattle and a little <laughs> frog right there on cue. <laughs> a little, little granule, huh? Yes, and that's in, down in the wine cellars in the cool room, and old ox yoke. <laughs> yeah. And uh, some of the brick molds, the cypress brick molds, which are really older than the house because they, they made the bricks right there on the place. So these were used to actually make the house, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, Unbelievable triangle ones well, uh, to make the columns round, and there the columns are supporting the upper gallery. Well, oh, those are gorgeous. And and the, uh, the, oh, there's those round bricks right out of the molds that, uh, that we saw. So the molds were made out of cypress, and then the bricks were poured into it, and then dried, and then used to build the house. Yes. You're very lucky to have those still oh. uh, on display there. That's fantastic. I think that family saved everything, and unfortunately, I'm a saver, too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still around. Uh, you, you know, you, you talk about French colonial architecture. Uh, uh, the, the house is just a beautiful example of that, located on False River. Now, when I think of plantations, I normally think of off the, uh, on the Mississippi River, but this is actually on False River. How, how did that plantation get there? Well, the, the, uh, the builder of the plantation was a marquis in France, and he was given a land grant by the French crown and came over to Louisiana and his first crops were indigo and this particular plantation had a contract with the Prussian army to make that blue dye for the uniforms. And then later on they switched to the production of sugar cane, which is still grown in the parish. Well, when I think of indigo, that, that was the color that the Acadians used as well to, to, to dye the mattress covers and their dresses and aprons. So indigo was being formed on Parlange for, for the Prussian army. Gee, that was a contract. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Madame X, we talked about Madame X. Uh, uh, we saw a picture of her mother there. A lot of history of this woman called Madame X at Parlange. Tell us the story of that. Well, she uh, was born in Louisiana on the plantation. But uh, uh, when her father was uh, killed in the uh, uh, Civil War at the Battle of Shiloh, um, her mother took her and her sister to France to be with her family. Her, her mother was French, you see, uh, de Tano, Marie Virginie de Tano, na named for her mother. And then her father uh, was uh, from a prominent Italian family in New Orleans Avenue family. His name was Major Anatole Avenue. Well, he was killed at the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War. So. Back they went to France, and this little girl grew up to be a celebrated beauty. Right. And it's painted by John Singer Sargent. And, and if I remember, the painting was quite revealing, and all of France went wild and called her Madame X because it revealed so much on the painting. But today, it's one of the most famous paintings hanging in the museums there, right? It is. It's strange because uh, we were talking to Mr. Town one day, and he said, you know, the family wouldn't accept that portrait by John Singer Sargent of Madame X so many years ago. He said, now it's famous and worth a <laughs> lot more than probably anything else. And he said, I bet they're sorry they didn't accept it. <laughs> when I was visiting with you last, you shared with me a great recipe for hush puppies. Now, hush puppies is always uh, cooked with fish. And, of course, Falls River is one of the great fishing lakes. I want to share that great hush puppy recipe with everybody here while we continue to talk. I've got two cups of self-rising cornmeal. I want you to stir that for me. And I'm going to put one egg in. I also have a cup of self-rising flour. Mix that around a little bit. And I'm going to add a cup of cream right down into it. And that's going to be the basis 
of the uh, Hush Puppy Mix. While you're stirring that, I want to ask you about two very famous generals that actually also stayed on Parlange Plantation. Who, uh, who were they and what was their role in the Civil War? Yes, well, the first general to arrive was General Nathaniel Banks, and of course he was with the Union Army. Sure. And um, Madam Parlange, my that time, had become Madam Parlange. She had married a second time after her first husband died, the Marquis Vincent de Ternard. And she was called back from France because they felt that this army was coming up the river, you see. She arrived before the general, and she and her little son, Charles, went out on the front gallery and gave General Banks the keys, and those old Norman keys, you know, right. that they had in those days. And had a basket of those keys that they gave to General Banks and offered him the hospitality of the home. So, so the home was spared. The home and then was spared. A, then a, then a, a Confederate general came in. That's and... true. After General Banks and his army left, General uh, Dick Taylor of the Southern Forces came, and uh, she again had to quarter his men and his right. army and the officers and all. And every night she gave a, a banquet in the, in the dining room for the general and his right. aides and had a barbecue given out in the garden for the and, soldiers. And, and then the two soldiers met at the Battle of Mansfield, and that was actually the last big victory for the Confederate forces. So, so those two generals played a very important part, and both of them stayed at Parlange Plantation. That's true. I've added a little corn to this, a little sugar, because we a little uh, because there's a lot of sugar Ooh, cane. Oh, that's and true. <laughs> whole kernel corn and jalapenos. And then I would deep fry the hush puppies at about 375 for a couple of minutes until they get golden brown. And this is what they look like right here mm. when it's all said and done. Fried hush puppies with uh, uh, with any kind of fried fish mm. is just absolutely fantastic. And this, <laughs> and this was one of those great dishes that I actually picked up when I was over at, uh, at Parlons. You've got a beautiful place there. Oh, it's so it's fantastic. I know your husband calls it constant company because <laughs> there's always people coming over, and I'm going to come back to visit again. I so hope you will. Thank you so much for visiting with oh, us. I appreciate all wonderful. the great stories. And thank you all for coming, and I want to make sure you come back as we continue to cook up more of these great Taste of Louisiana. We're going to taste a little hush puppies here. Mm. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. This is PBS. The companion cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $22.95. The Evolution of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Fulce features recipes and food history behind Louisiana's cuisine. This 352-page cookbook contains over 250 recipes, including those from this show. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.